Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Evan, do you ever watch the games and think, I know what Brad is thinking exactly at this moment? No. That's for the best. Yeah. I'm I, sorry you have to live through that. <laughs> thinking about Brad while he's not even in my house? Yeah, that's it's probably a sign of some kind of disorder. My night is worse off for it. But while Derek Lalone was losing it on the refs last night, and he very visibly said at one point, what the F is goalie interference, like word for word, I thought, oh, man, I can feel Brad's heart growing three sizes right now. Derek Lalone immediately just became Brad's favorite coach of all time. Immediately, it's Newsy. Right away, Brad will never say another ill word about Red Wings coaching as long as Newsy's there. Plain and simple. This is all factual. How happy were you? Because it went goalie. It went reviewing whether the goal was in and then reviewing whether it was goalie interference. And by that point, they were both long reviews. So by that point, it felt like, what, 10 minutes without a goal call? About that, yeah, literally about that. And I was like, oh, God, we're not going to hear the end of this tomorrow (laughs) from Brad. And then Newsy going off. What even is goaltender interference? I was like, yeah. There it is. That's a man of the people right there. Newsy saved me a lot of talking today because uh, he asked the question, not me. Well, Newsy did the talking yesterday. We're here to talk to you today. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, prospects, and definitely not knowing what the hell goal- goalie interference is. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we'll be recapping Detroit's wild seven-goal victory over the Pittsburgh Penguins, in which uh, they put a seven spot up on Casey DeSmith. And even though Pittsburgh scored four, Detroit walked away with the W. We'll be talking about the draft lottery standings, where Detroit is at, their upcoming games, and how the rest of the season is projecting. There is news with regards to Red Wings and their injuries for the rest of the season. Who's in, who's out. Uh, notably players like Fabry, Zadina, Sherratt, Edvinson, etc. And then signings. We talked last episode about prospects who we would have our eye on, Mazur, uh, Willander, Casper, and some others. And those wheels have already started to turn. As Steve Eisman has started to bring those guys in, not just for next year, but the rest of the season. We'll be giving you a prospect profile this week and some other small news uh, across the re- world of the Red Wings and hockey before getting into overtime. Before that, some quick announcements. Uh, Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA, Saturday, April 8th, against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Folks, tickets are completely sold out. We squeezed every last ticket into that event that we could, and they are all gone. You have raised uh, an incredible amount of support for the Jamie Daniels Foundation, so thank you very much. Again, the order of events for the day goes. uh, Doors open for the arena. We'll be at a table in the concourse, giving away goodies to everyone who, who wants to come see us. You don't have to have tickets to the event. Uh, we'll all watch the game together. It's a 1 p.m. game. And then post-game, we'll be in the uh, Budweiser Beer Garden uh, attached. It's part of the LCA uh, for the live recording of the Winged Wheel podcast for it, featuring Ken Daniels uh, and some other uh, fun surprises for you there, merch giveaways, uh, meet and greet, etc. There's going to be a Q&A portion. And uh, we'll get all those details down for you uh, on the website, wingedwheelpodcast.com slash blog, and on Twitter, follow us at wingedwheelpod. Speaking of support for the Jamie Daniels Foundation, we are going to be auctioning off one more uh, game slash meet and greet with Ken Daniels package. It's for the last Red Wings home game of the season, which is on April 10th uh, against the Dallas Stars. That's a Monday. So you get two tickets to the Red Wings game, a meet and greet with Ken Daniels in the gondola, and who knows who else you might run into up there, and a piece of a Winged Wheel podcast merch, whether it be the flannel, the quarter zip, or whatever it, uh, it is that you want. So that'll be posting soon. Keep your eyes peeled for that one. All proceeds benefit the Jamie Daniels Foundation. It's crazy, actually, to think we only have, like, nine games left. It is. I feel like this last phase of the season has actually moved quicker than in previous years. I think you're right. The season both feels like it's been long and quick at the same time. It's the benefit of playing more meaningful hockey, for sure. Like, this is absolutely a function of the Red Wings keeping things interesting longer. Yeah. Like playing important games right up until the trade deadline was way more impactful than we thought it even would be in the moment. 
So let's keep that up, Red Wings. Yeah, let's do more of that. Yeah. Why don't you guys want to tank anymore? <laughs> For <laughs> sanity. Yeah, please. Uh, okay. The Red Wings won a 7-4 game against the Pittsburgh Penguins, who are, in theory, competing for a playoff spot. Brad, you said this almost as a throwaway line last episode. Pittsburgh's goaltending is so damn bad. I was watching that whole game thinking, the Boston Bruins are going to fry these guys in the first round. And no, anything can happen in the playoffs, but when when DeSmith gets beat that badly one-on-one, by Perron and Perron's a good shooter, but the shots weren't really that anything that special. Maybe one of them was decent. They're in trouble. Like that team is in serious trouble. Uh, every game in that series, uh, take the over, <laughs> which Honestly. by game four will be set at like 12 and a half. Unbelievable. When there's a, a one-on-one between shooter and goalie, and it's not like on a breakaway where there's movement. It's just a shooter set, the goalie is set. And at the NHL level, that should be a save. Like if that shot's not coming off of one of the most elite shooter sticks, that should be a save most of the time. And the way Perron put that puck in, I was like, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm very happy Perron got the hat trick. I'm obviously happy for the Red Wings win. But in the interest of, of just like taking a neutral observer's view and, and thinking, are the Pittsburgh Penguins really trying to fend off Florida right now? Because they are not playing like it. Well, neither is Florida. <laughs> no. No, this remember that one year um where the Red Wings it was either year twenty four or twenty five of the playoff streak, and it came down to the last day of the season. The Red Wings were in eighth place, and if they won, they were in. If they lost, I forget who was in ninth, but they also had to lose. Um, and that was how Detroit would get in, and Detroit went into New York. And just put up an awful performance, lost, and then I forget who the other team was. They also lost, and Detroit tripped and fell into the playoffs. Yeah. That is going to be the Pittsburgh Penguins this year. They are doing their best to not make the playoffs, but damn it, Florida won't let them. Barzell went down, and I made that comment that, you know, that's really going to hurt the Islanders, and that'll be good for the Red Wings down the stretch. Between the Islanders, Pittsburgh, Florida, Buffalo, Ottawa, Washington, and Detroit. The Islanders are the only ones who have performed well. Yeah, they really stabilized the ship when Barzell went down. They're the only ones above 500 among all those teams I just named. The Eastern wildcard race is interesting, but not in a way where every team is winning when they should. It's just a bunch of people. It's who whoever is going to trip over their own feet less. Anyhow, good for the Red Wings last night. They beat the Penguins. Always a good thing to do. Uh, you know, that's the last, I think, big rivalry that the Red Wings had, uh, which goes back to 08 09, which is depressing to think about. They took a 3 nothing lead in the first period. And after that first period, I thought, mm, this is why the Red Wings were in the mix so late because this is their competition. Uh, Berggren got a power play goal. Uh, Andrew Kopp scored off of a cider point shot. Kubelik, they didn't change that goal back, I guess. It was a Lindstrom shot that hit off Friedman, maybe Kubli. Might have grazed him yeah. on, on the way in or hit him before it hit Friedman. I don't know. I want to talk about that first goal, though, because that one made me laugh. The Bear Green goal? Aud- audibly laugh. Yeah. Because we've seen the Red Wings try that high to low to the bumper play a million times this year. I think that's the first time it's worked. And, of course, it was executed by a, a rookie and Austin Zarnick. That's right. That's right, Austin Zarnick. Good for him. <laughs> this season is just so weird in so many unique ways. Well, I mean, the Red Wings injury sheet, and we're going to be talking about that. Players like Zarnick are just casually slipping into the lineup, and you don't even notice anymore because it looks like Sherratt, Zadina, Fabry, Chason, Edmondson, Huso, like everyone's hurt right now. Not, not only is Austin Zarnick playing a regular shift and nobody notices, He's on the power play. Yep. Even in the prime of Austin Zarnick's career, how much power play time do you think he ever got? Good well, for we're him. in his prime. <laughs> we are in his prime right now. We are. <laughs> the So the Red Wings went up 3 nothing, and then the second period was all Pittsburgh. Zucker, Gensel, Carter. Which one of those was the uh, – it was the 3-3 goal. So it was Jeff Carter's goal in the end, the power play goal, where initially it was reviewed – uh, it was ruled no goal on the ice. 
And then upon review, the puck was under Nedeljkovic's skate. Nedeljkovic played start at the game. Pushed in. They said, yep, it's a good goal. I agreed. I think that puck did cross the line. They made the call that they had to. And then there, it was challenged, and Brad's eyes rolled 720 degrees in his own skull. Derek Lalone challenged it uh, based on, you know, when Ned's puck, when Ned's pad was pushed in, was it pushed in at, uh, as part of, you know, trying to shoot the puck or follow through on a shot or something like that. I don't know. It was a gray area for me without spending an hour trying to deduce whether it was goalie interference. How'd you feel about the call? This is the most angry I've been about a goalie interference call in years. Cause you know, we make the joke and obviously Newsy uh, agrees. What is goalie interference? It's so vague. And how do you review something that's so vague? But I think I've referenced them before, but a while ago, Down Goes Brown wrote a really good article about goalie interference. He said, it's not as complicated as you think, and here's why. And one of the main points he laid out was, if you touch the goalie in the blue paint, it's no goal almost 100% of the time. Outside of the blue, then you start getting into intent and positioning and who guided who, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the blue paint, if you do anything of your own volition, i.e. the defenseman didn't throw you into the goalie, it's no goal. And one of the examples of that was if the puck is under the goalie and you push the goalie into the puck and that pushes the puck into the net, it's no goal 100 out of 100 times. We have seen this play all the time. It, I have never once seen it count. So even though we all make fun of what is goalie interference, this was one of the more clear-cut, black-and-white interpretations of the rule. This should be no goal 100 out of 100 times. There's no defending this. So, you know, Mickey's reaction on the broadcast was perfect. His just true and utter bewilderment of, what, that counted? Mickey went so far as to stick his neck, neck out and say, yeah, I think this is going to come back. I, I think this is going to be no goal. Immediately when he said that, I'm like, oh, the hockey gods heard that. Yeah. We know how they're going to rule. He must have, He must be a podcaster. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. He's, he's suited for this. So obviously my confusion uh, mirrored Mickey's, and I think everybody else in the hockey world, not just Red Wings fandom, was also as confused and in some cases as angry as Newsy. Because the only thing... The only argument that I thought might have made a touch of sense, the one replay kind of proved that wrong, was maybe Zucker's stick got under and, and hit the puck and hit the puck and propelled it in. Still, Jeff Carter's goal on the goal sheet. Yeah. So if they thought Zucker got it, it's Zucker's goal. They didn't give the goal to Zucker's, so they didn't think that's what happened. So, and and the replay showed it didn't really happen. So I I. You know, for all the all the jokes we make about what is going on, this is actually legitimately the most confusing one I have seen. Well, it was called a good goal. The Red Wings are penalized, obviously, for the unsuccessful challenge. Derek Lalone lost it on the bench. You know, what the F is goalie interference, which is hysterical thing to say. Like, what's going on? Like, hey, that tirade, if you, if you haven't seen it, go at Winged Wheel Pod on Twitter. We posted the video. It is just an all-time. It is an all-time tirade. He got tossed from the game. Bob Bugner's laughing practically on the bench <laughs> as he's now taken over. Good on the Red Wings for how they responded after. I mean, they they picked up the energy and were were well in the mix after the second period. But yeah, I I don't blame Newsy at all. I I know he said today in his uh, his press availability that you know he wishes that he would have been a little bit more calm about it, but he would still make the challenge a hundred times out of a hundred. I don't know. I'm happy that he I'm happy that a scene was made of that one because I agree. It just seemed the whole thing seemed weird. I I can hear an argument for it, but it doesn't exactly track with based on what was on the score sheet. Anyhow. Conspiracy theory. Yeah. NHL's doing it so they can ensure Crosby's back in the playoffs. Well, Casey DeSmith did his best. And then it, yeah. <laughs> they didn't factor in their uh, double agent, Casey DeSmith. Because then David Perron very nearly scored a natural hat trick. Josh Archibald got a goal in there. Uh, Pittsburgh la- Pittsburgh's last, but Detroit went up four three off a of Perron goal. Archibald tied it, and then Perron, and then Perron again. All and in, in within those two goals were within forty five seconds of each other. Absolutely a terrible display of goaltending by 
by DeSmith. Credit to Perron for putting the pucks in the net, of course. One of those was a power play goal, too. Dylan Larkin sealed it uh, on the empty netter. Perron hat trick. Nedeljkovic gets his first win, I believe, since November 6th. First Oof. recorded win. Uh, he made some key saves. Obviously, it wasn't a perfect performance. Still four goals went in, but he made some some good saves, so good for him. Happy that he got the W on the board. And the Red Wings get a win over uh, over Pittsburgh. They got to play spoiler a little bit, which, yeah, tank implications aside and draft implications aside, obviously wasn't an ideal result for that. But as we've said a million times, and we'll say a million times more, you can't expect the players on the ice to play to lose. That's just not how these things work. So the way we do it, celebrate the wins and don't be too upset about the losses at this point this year. So that's the Red Wings. And they took a 7-4 win against a team, a Pittsburgh team that is going to have to change some things around if they want to do anything in the playoffs. What you're telling me, uh, Mikhail... the trade deadline is already come and gone though. So yeah, that's right. What you're telling me, Mikhail Granlund and uh, Dmitry Kulikov weren't game breakers last night. Shocking. Why did Sullivan leave to Smith in for six goals? They were bad goals. Like maybe the first period, you might be able to explain away the first period. Maybe is Jerry hurt? I, he was actually back- yeah. He was backing up last night, I believe, um, but he is coming off an injury. Yes. Anyways, Red Wings win. Crowd was pumped up. Good for Ned. Good for Perron. Good for uh, Hockey Town. Upcoming games, Detroit has uh, Thursday night at home against Carolina and then Friday on the road against Winnipeg before hosting Toronto on the road, or sorry, not hosting, playing in Toronto on Sunday at 7 Eastern. So quite a gamut of... uh, either strong playoff teams or teams fighting for their playoff lives in Winnipeg uh, coming up. But then again, that's what Pittsburgh should have been. So Yeah, I was going to say Winnipeg. the Pitt, Some say the Pittsburgh of the <laughs> West right now. We'll see how the Red Wings fare in those games. Uh, as of the actual standings, I tweeted as the Red Wings game just started that a St. Louis overtime win over Vancouver would be perfect for them in terms of the lottery standings. And lo and behold, even though Vancouver, St. Louis was up, I think, 5-2 at one point against Vancouver, they still ended up winning that game in overtime. Jacob Rana, sleeper agent? Hey. My God. <laughs> All part of the plan. So the Red Wings are currently eighth in the Connor Bedard lottery. So they still are uh, behind Vancouver and St. Louis in the overall standings, which for Team Tank, that's great. Uh, really, that should, that's the ideal result for the Red Wings. they got to win and maintain their spot. Big W by Philly last night, too. Oh, yeah. Philly kept pace. They are within three points of Detroit, so it's not completely out of the question uh, for Detroit to finish as low as seventh. Uh, Some more news from the Red Wings. Uh, Robbie Fabry, as kind of has been uh, leading up to, he's been declared out for the rest of the season. Thankfully, he is expected to be ready for the start of next season, is going to have a minor procedure to take care of presumably his knee. Uh, will be four to six weeks for recovery. So, honestly, yep. it's well. I mean, f- with his hi- history of uh, uh, knee injury, this is kind of best case scenario for him. I think his knee and the doctor on first name basis at this point. The doctor probably has the rights to name his knee. Yeah, he actually keeps uh, an inventory of ACLs in his uh, dr- desk drawer in his office for when Robbie comes through. How long until we go to like the Archer style cyborg? Because I feel bad for the guy because it's just a genetics thing at this point, right? I mean, if they're not already doing it, I'm a touch disappointed. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, he's not going to miss too much time, even for like rest and recovery during the off season and rebuilding his body. So good, good news for Robbie, and happy that he avoided the worst possible news. Uh, Zadina potentially could be out for the season. Uh, Huso, I think they're war- he might work his way back in. Um, they, I think it's a little touch and go with him. I, they'll try, uh, just to kind of see how things go. I don't think they're going to push who's too far, even if he's ready again, we're probably going to see a lot of Ned and or Helberg, depending on how things shake out on that front and keeping who's I would also stop them from having to make a decision, right? Uh, not that the last nine or so games really that matter that much in terms of those two, but then you don't have to worry about the whole waiver process or whatever. We have reached the point in the season though, more importantly, not even the slightest risk for any injury. No. If Huso is feeling anything less than 110%, shut him down. Yep. And uh, Sherratt and Edmondson are expected to play uh, the upcoming games, or at least uh, one of the upcoming games. I know Sherratt's been fighting something, especially late in the season. And Edmondson's going to come in and out. I 
we said this last episode too. The expectation here is that he's not going to play more than his nine games, so they're not going to burn a year of his ELC. Uh, but they are going to get him in a few games to end the season. Yeah, and if he is, you know, battling a, a nagging injury, probably better to have him with Detroit's training staff. So yeah, keep him around just so he gets a bit better quality of care and the games he does play is you know a preview for what he can expect next season. Um. Yeah, it's less minutes playing into Detroit too. If he is banged up, yeah, he'll go. If he went back down to Grand Rapids, I'm assuming he'd have to carry a lot more of the load def- on the defensive end. So at least in Detroit, it's a little bit more relaxed yeah. per se. The Red Wings uh, medical staff earning their keep these last couple of months of the season. All right, let's get into some fun news. We talked last episode about uh, the college free agents and the SHL or sorry, the college prospects and the SHL prospects, and things happen fast. Uh, let's start in chronological order. William Linder, we said, yeah, probably ready to turn pro, but maybe he could even be left in Rogla for another season based on, you know, the amount of prospects that are coming through. No, right away, signed to a three-year entry-level contract beginning next season, and we'll also report to the Grand Rapids Griffins on an amateur tryout for the remainder of this 2022-2023 season, which means he can play with Grand Rapids, won't be called up to Detroit, but can play with Grand Rapids, uh, and they get a little bit of an early, earlier look, and he's able to get kind of get his feet wet at this uh, the end of the AHL season. Grand Rapids is out of the playoff mix. They're not, um, they haven't done well at all this season, really, in terms of the standings. I don't think mathematically out yet, or they're close to it. At the very least, Wallander can get some games in, but... Uh, Initial reactions to Wallander being brought into the fold? Not very surprised with how strong of a season he had in the SHL. Um, And the Red Wings are at that point in the rebuild where, not to rush prospects, but they're definitely past the point of being able to over-ripen them because if they want to turn the corner, they need the Carter Mazers, the Wallanders, the Caspers to start taking spots in the next year or two. Um so every little bit of help they can get in transitioning to North American hockey and the Red Wings can get in figuring out exactly where they are in their de- development curve is critical right now. So, you know, getting Wallander over here, getting him some meaningful minutes, some meaningful games, you know, obviously we've talked about how the North American game is different from in Sweden. So this will kind of, amplify his strengths on this ice and amplify his weaknesses, which should give him, you know, a whole summer to, to figure some things out, to work on some things, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. But also the wings are at very much at the point in the rebuild too, where they have to start really prioritizing the top prospects. We all love, you know, the Jared McIsaacs and the Donovan Sobrangos and the Emil Viros of the world. And we all hope they can become something. And, you know, they're still good prospects, but Wallander could be, not just a guy, he could be a guy. So you got to get him minutes. You got to put him at the front of the line. Uh, You know, same thing that like they did with Edmondson and Johansson this year. Same thing they're doing with Mazer and Casper up front. So, you know, I'm, I think it makes a ton of sense and, you know, I hope he does well. Like, is it crazy to think that they are going to try him out on the right side to see if he can't play that position for, well, not for Detroit next season, but potentially for Detroit in the future. Because obviously he's done so in Rogla in, in Sweden. If he says he's more comfortable on the left side, you break him in on the left side. Because it's already going to be tough enough for him transitioning leagues, transitioning styles of hockey, transitioning from, you know. But he may prefer the right. Yeah, If he says he likes the right better, by all means, put him on the right. Yeah. Um, but. If he says he prefers the left, they should put him on the left. So I don't I don't think there's any motivation in the signing now in terms of – because by the time he makes an impact in the NHL in a year or two, who the hell knows what that roster is going to look like? Maybe the Red Wings went out and traded for Eric Carlson or something dumb like that. Like a year is a tremendous amount of time. So I, I think as important as it is for the Red Wings to make sure the top prospects are getting in the fast lane – that they're still developing them properly and they're still doing what's best for the player at this point. And then, you know, once you're in the playoffs year after year after year, you can start getting picky with 
who's get who are we going to shoehorn in where because that's the only gap we have. Well, well, Linder's in the system. Grand Rapids, at the very least, is going to have uh, another serious uh, contender for for Blue Line minutes. And hey, as we've learned with Soderblom and as we've learned with other players, there are roster spots to be won on these Red Wings. And uh, yes, the defense did get a little better, but it has a long ways to go. So if he shows well and has a really good off season and a really good training camp, he could be one of those players that I would not be incredibly surprised to see in the mix for one of those last defensive roster spots. We'll talk about his uh, uh, his teammate in Marco Casper in just a little bit here, but let's get to probably the more expected news, which is that the Red Wings brought in Carter Mazer, college for, or not college college prospect, just wrapped up his season with Denver, signed him to a three year ELC, same parameters, starts for next season, uh, but has his amateur tryout with the Grand Rapids Griffins for the rest of this season. Is actually making his debut tonight, uh, pretty much right now as we record. So uh, Carter Mazer comes in. It's not one to one, but uh, the Red Wings just lost Bertuzzi, and now they they have Carter Mazer in the fold and closer to the Red Wings roster at the very least in the AHL system. Uh, that's going to be, I think, an important one for the Red Wings forward future. I would argue Carter Mazer and Marco Casper are the two most important prospects in the Red Wings system right now. More so than Costa, not necessarily best, but most important because the Red Wings have such a problem scoring goals. And these are the two guys in the system that are forwards who might be able to do it. I, I think Costa's ceiling is higher than both of them. Um, I think his long term, you know, impact could be could be greater. But the Red Wings have Huso. Huso's good. You know, they they have options. They can't score goals. Yeah. And even between Casper and Mazer, goal scoring is more of Mazer's thing. So, you know, and being a third round pick, finding value in places where you don't necessarily expect to. And we've talked about this for eight years where, yeah, the first round picks are going to hit more often than they don't. But you got to find a few gems outside of the first round if you're going to turn a rebuild around. And, and Mazer is checking all the boxes right now of what the Red Wings need. Again, much like Wallander, it makes a ton of sense. Get him in the pro game this year. Get his feet wet. Let him learn some things, his strengths, his weaknesses at this level. Have a full off season to digest that, work on it, and then come into camp ready. I don't expect the uh, Mazer to make the Red Wings next year, but he had a good enough year. It's not out of the realm of possibility, a, a good camp and a good preseason, and he pushes for a spot. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see Mazer challenge. Based on the type of player he is, Like he plays a physical game, uh, and that kind of energy I think can translate to the NHL a little bit easier and, and what the Red Wings need. Like the the Red Wings need some elbow in their lineup. They need a little bit of grit, and they need a guy who's not going to drag them down uh, by bringing that in. And he kind of checks multiple boxes at the same time. Yeah, the the Red Wings really need a a Zach Hyman type player, mm-hmm. and not that Carter Mazur will likely ever be as good at Zach Hyman, but that is that very much fits the description of if you're like if you're describing Carter Mazur, there's going to be a lot of overlap when you're describing Zach Hyman. Um, and again, it, the expectation for Mazer, and I should have said this for Wallander too, is a very, you know, let's not expect too much for the rest of this season. They're just getting their feet wet. Don't expect them to blow the roof off. Yeah. Um, if they can tread water for the rest of the year, that's great. If they look like they at least belong at this level, that's more than enough, whether or not the counting stats come. And then a full season in Grand Rapids for each of them next year, and then you're hoping they're pushing for the Red Wings the year after that. That should be the expectation, and anything above that is you know Maybe. just a bonus. Yeah, and for context, for those who don't know, uh, Mazer, uh, a winger drafted in the third round, like Brad mentioned in 2021, played two seasons two seasons at Denver, uh, 14 and 22 goals respectively, 38 and 37 points. So you know produced well for a guy who maybe didn't people didn't think would produce to that degree, especially 22 goals this past season. You know, his favorite player growing up was Darren Helm on the Red Wings. Oh, boy. Yeah, likes to wear 43 because of that. So all the Darren Helm stands, you now have your new deity to pray to. But uh, it's been – that was maybe a little bit of the comp for convenience more than anything at the time of the draft. And now you get a lot more of the Bertuzzi comparisons, which I don't think is that crazy to say. I like Brad said, you have to keep expectations limited. You know, with Mazer, don't come in and expect twenty goals and 
uh, him to play the exact role Bertuzzi played in season one of him being on the Red Wings whenever he does make it. But I do think it's not crazy for him to kind of reach that point at some time in his career. Uh, and again, it's, it's a very hard kind of player to find. The Red Wings have a big hole in their roster after trading Bertuzzi. I think it's something they had to do, but that's a hard archetype of a player to to locate. And they're looking to Mazur to kind of be that guy of the future. Maybe not play on the first line like Bertuzzi did because you're, you'd hope you'd have first line wingers to to fill those roles with some more production, but that up and down the lineup make an impact no matter what role kind of guy. He would be my pick for outside shot to make the team. Yep, yep, same. Maybe that is a hot take considering the next guy we're going to talk about, which is Marco Casper. Yeah, but is anybody surprised if Casper makes the team next year? No, and he actually veers a little bit into the he should territory. I, I won't be upset if he doesn't, but he's he's that 50-50 guy like when uh, Raymond came over. And I, actually, I don't even think we gave Raymond 50-50 odds at no, the time when, when he made the team. So uh, that's probably closer to Casper's expectation. So there's nothing uh, officially announced with Casper. So at the time of recording, there's no official indication or anything uh, from the Red Wings end. Rogla did say, the official Rogla website did say that Casper would be coming over to North America to play uh, unspecified in terms of whether it be Grand Rapids or Detroit. But, you know, if you want to do some two and two together, you might say, yep, yeah, he's going to have the same amateur tryout with the Griffins. That said, that's just a guess. I don't have any... Um, indication on whether that's exactly what's uh, transpiring right now. Uh, but assuming Casper does come over and do the same thing, I know he's talked about wanting to play in the Worlds before, which is why it was a little bit surprising. But I think it's, hey, come play with Grand Rapids and then go back and do the Worlds and finish your studies and what have you. Uh, but, you know, exciting to see Willinder, exciting to see Mazer. Casper is the big one, though. When you pick a guy in the top 10 at a direct position of need right near the end of a rebuild, yeah, he's a pretty important prospect. Um, and again, I'm not going to repeat about why it would be beneficial to get some seasoning towards the end of a season, but Casper is the unique one because anytime you have a young center come over to North America, the questions inevitably arise. Well, is he going to play center? And depending on the strengths of the weaknesses of the player, sometimes guys get started on the wing and then move to center. And that's more so what I'm curious to see about with Casper than anything else. I think the way he plays, he's he's the perfect style of player to come over and just be a center. Like, don't play on the wing. Just get your feet wet at center. Grand Rapids, great place to do it. That team is ass this year, so there's literally nothing to lose by trying him at center. Um, get him some reps in, get him used to the North American style and, and kind of let him develop into the role that it's so unfair to say this, but let him develop into the role we need him to play. Oh, absolutely. I don't think that's unfair. That's what the Red Wings need. Yeah, they should do. Yeah. Yeah. Th this, this guy is a center. He should be a center for a long time. He should be a center on the Red Wings, maybe as early as next year. So Getting him some reps at center in Grand Rapids as soon as possible does seem beneficial. I do have concerns about, you know, if the guy just played a full professional season in the SHL, played a playoff round, is going to come over, play another, you know, five to ten games in North America, and then go back and compete in a world championship, and then, you know, finish his schooling after that. At what point do you legitimately worry about burnout, though? Cut the school. <laughs> He's not going to need that. Do what Dion Phaneuf did and just write NHL at the top of your tests. That's right. Honestly, I, I understand that you know priorities are different for certain players, but I don't know if I'd send him to the Worlds. It's going to be a hard sell for that player, though. I, I agree, but if I had to determine what is more important for Marco Casper's development, 10 games in the World Championships or 10 games with the Grand Rapids Griffins, I'm picking Grand Rapids. Lucas Raymond played full 82 games after uh, his SHL season. He did miss the end of it, and I believe international play because he had, what, was it an elbow thing at the time? Yeah, I think he broke his elbow in, and, in the year before he came over. And he did come in and uh, play a full 82 after that, and I called her, called her competitive campaign, so it's not unheard of. They're young. They're pliable. These guys bounce back quickly. They have what we don't have, youth, energy. Vigor. Ligaments. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I am I agree with you, though, Brad, in terms of positionality. Like, this is a player where 
I, I wouldn't say throw the, hey, don't be, uh, don't have too high of expectations out the window. I think we need to be very measured in terms of what we expect of prospects in their first year. But he's a guy you should be looking towards being ready sooner and making an impact sooner. I don't mean day one, and I don't even, even necessarily mean season one, but you should see a path to how he's going to fit in on the Red Wings pretty early. I won't be disappointed if he doesn't make it, but I'll be kind of disappointed if he doesn't make it. That's fair. Like not in him, but just that it didn't shake out that way. Uh, yeah, and uh, he was drafted as a sort of refined player. We don't know what his ceiling is, but his floor is extremely high. Mm-hmm. For him to not transition to the NHL quickly would be underwhelming for me. Yeah, and he he's a very smart player, and he plays a, a little bit of sandpaper. So I think he will transition just fine to the North American style game. We want Carter Mazur and Marco Casper to come in and just punch everyone in the nose, and we want Wollinder to come in to continue to build a world record tallest blue line. That's pretty much it. That's that's all we ask. Like it's not that much. Are we going to win very many games? We don't know, but it's going to be funny we'll while be we tall. do it. Yeah, we'll be tall. We'll be. We're going to punch you in the nose. Imagine a top four where Jake Wallman is the shortest player. Yeah, he's a big boy. That's a big body. That's very obviously what Steve Eiserman is going for. I don't hate it. Just seeing Edvinson and how he's he was able to use his reach. He had a uh, he let the puck bobble off his stick at the blue line and very nearly let a breakaway go the other way and. What else did he do other than use his, what, 15 feet of reach? Go-go gadget arms? Yeah. Spread his stick out and got the poke check to recover. And I was like, not great that he lost a puck to the blue line like that, but what a recovery. Yep. That's, uh, you can see Eisenman's vision. So those are the players that we have any information on so far. Again, Mazer and Willander were announced formally. Uh, Nothing yet on Casper, but maybe by the time you're listening, there will be something. Uh, but if we're able to see all three by the end of the year, uh, I think we'll be very fortunate as Red Wings and Griffins fans. The future is coming. It almost, uh, it almost felt like the Cavalry as we kind of really, I don't want to say succumb to, but have come to accept what the end of the season has been and is going to continue to be for the Red Wings. It's a, it's a bummer. Like, let's call it what it is. It's not fun to expect to lose and then be in a position to want to lose again. Uh, so it's nice that the Red Wings have a direct vision on what their future is going to be. Like, hey, we're signing these guys. Not only are they coming next season, but here's a little sneak preview of them now. Was it last year or the year? Maybe it was last year where, like, Jake Chelios was playing for the Red Wings. Oh, it was a, that was a couple of years ago. Is that at a least. couple? Of, yeah. yeah. Right? Okay. Maybe Time it was a flat circle in the middle yeah. of a rebuild. It feels like it could be last year or three years ago. So at least we're past that era of the final 20 games i think that was yeah that was a, we're we're removed from that a little bit <laughs> this is how we're going to examine the re, every year of the rebuild towards the end on a scale of jake chelius to austin charnick <laughs> how random are these fill-ins <laughs> did any of these guys who played at the end of the year play for team china in the olympics no yeah, that's right so that's a real thing that happened J- J- jake chelios is four years younger than me that's it and uh, Evan, you're going to be upset to hear that it was four years ago. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> you were saying that. I'm like, buddy, that was not last year. Uh... Yeah, yeah. He has played four full seasons with the Kunlun Red Star uh, since yeah. then. <laughs> uh... You're gonna. What year is it? <laughs> we're we're not going to tell you. We're going to see if you remember. Uh, okay, speaking of prospects, let's take a look forward to the NHL draft. Uh, our prospect profile series continues. And uh, we are going to talk about someone that may be of interest to the Red Wings later in the first round, as it looks like the New York Islanders are going to spoil all the fun and give Detroit pick like 23 or something. Uh, Callum Ritchie, right-handed shooting center in the OHL, a uh, big guy already sitting around six foot two, is uh, a player who had maybe a, a more of a prominent standing in the world of prospects coming into the season than he does now. But it's still going to be um, a prospect of interest, I think, based on what the Red Wings are looking for. So who is Callum Ritchie? What kind of tools does he have? And can you put it all together? Right shot shooting center, who's a, a decent skater, really good hands, excellent shot. Um, you know, a- a- everything you think you would want in a center. And yet he has been falling down draft boards all year. And he's one I struggle with because when you read about the tools and then you go watch them you see all the tools nobody's lying nobody's you know overestimating his skill 
you see it. But every time I watch him at the Holinka with Oshawa, whatever level it might be, I always feel unsatisfied afterwards. Like, that was okay, but, you know, you ever look at something and you know something's wrong, but you can't put your finger on it? Mm -hmm. You can't quite identify what's wrong. You just know something's off. That's the vibe I've been getting all year with Callum Ritchie. And, you know, he had the huge first year in the OHL, and his counting stats this year in the O were, were still pretty good. Maybe not quite what people were expecting him to put up this year preseason, but, again, good. And But, yeah, I just... I, is it a compete thing? It might be. I know. Isn't uh, Oshawa really bad? Oh, they're horrible. Um, I know in Pronman's uh, scale system, you know, relative to NHL, he has Callum Ritchie's compete level listed at below average, which you very rarely see on, on first round uh, prospects. Um, And Pronman, you know, he's probably the best prospector in terms of getting a feel for what the NHL is thinking, you know, beyond Bob McKenzie, who just compiles a list because he talks to the scouts problem and kind of bases his lists around that stuff. And, and he is really spot on with a lot of them. And, and a lot of what he has said has been absolutely accurate. He was the only guy who had Shane Rake going for. Mm -hmm. So when he lists something like that, people are noticing. If we notice it when we're watching him I don't know. I really, really, really want to be wrong because if you can get a guy of Callum Ritchie's caliber with the Islanders pick and he's a center and he's skilled and he produces, how the hell do you not want that? So, you know, Callum Ritchie's a guy I'm rooting for. Like, I want him to, I want everyone to be wrong about him. But every viewing I've had, I come away with the same feeling. We had a uh, an overtime question maybe last episode or uh, the episode before where someone asked us, it was user uh, or Patreon supporter Babe Landiscog, and they said, what do you mean by toolsy, a toolsy player? And we made the distinction between a guy who has a lot of the physical tools, but, uh, you know, it's a little bit, not completely, but a little bit exclusive of hockey IQ, so the way you think the game. So players can have the physical attributes, or, or they can do things on the ice, but the way they kind of put it all together, so to speak, that can feel a little bit different. Uh, there can be a guy who isn't an all tools kind of player, but just thinks the game at an elite level and can do things that yeah, a toolsy player, so to speak, couldn't. I don't want to peg Callum Ritchie as having low hockey IQ. I don't get that sense from his game because he sometimes applies it in such a way where, like the the playmaking he displays and the what he does with the puck on his stick, like I think he thinks the game reasonably well. But I agree with you in that the application and the inconsistency is there for me. Um, I've really he's a guy who, in anticipation of this. I've kind of circled back to a little bit more seen some indication that, yeah, the counting stats shouldn't be something that you're too afraid of. But, yeah, something is uh, – he's certainly not like a top half of the first round guy for me right now. If you're wondering, like, you know, because obviously we're being pretty hard on the kid, which isn't necessarily fair for something we can't exactly identify. But I think he's a first round pick. Yeah, the vi I know this turned into a very contentious topic in the 2019 draft, but a lot of the vibes I was getting from Kirby Doc then, which is why I had him rated so much lower uh, versus consensus, are a lot of the same things I'm getting with Callum Ritchie. The, the pace, the compete, the just something looks off. But Doc is a good story of, you know, all the tools were there. You were wondering if he was ever going to put it together in his first few years in the NHL. He very much did not. Yeah. But then this year, something clicked. It, you, it's there. He was producing. It was good. That might be the same thing that happens with Callum Ritchie, where it just might take him a while to get it. Yeah. To figure it out. Whatever clicked in Doc this year, you hope the same thing clicks in Ritchie because. You know, I think Doc ultimately had a higher ceiling, and I, I like Doc more in his draft year than I, I like Callum Ritchie now. But I'm just using it as a comparison for this is kind of how I was feeling about him then. This is how I'm feeling about this guy now. And Doc being a good success story of, yeah, it looked pretty bleak for a few years there. But then, you know, he he, he figured it all out. So that possibility for me is there with Callum Ritchie, which, you know, if the, the Islanders pick ends up being like 24-25, might be a very worthwhile gamble. Yeah, I and let's talk about what he does well. You mentioned Brad, you know, his offensive ability, his what he's able to do with the puck on his stick, his playmaking, 
And by all rights, when he's on and, and things are going well for him, he's considered a guy who can play up and down the ice. You know, he's trusted by his coaches in all different situations. And if you're a right shot center who who's big and can uh, not be a liability offensively and still be trusted in your own defensive zone, then maybe that's the kind of guy that you do draft with a later first round pick. And you understand that it's a little bit of a project, but if he can, you know, put it all together, then that's one hell of a player to, to get with, uh, you know, pick 25, maybe for example. I think that one thing that leads me to not being wowed by Callum Ritchie is he's not very explosive, but I totally think explosive. He's, he is mechanically a good skater and I think explosiveness can be built on the foundation he has for his skating. So I think it would be worth the gamble if you've got a 20s pick in the first round because I think the things that he needs to work on are extremely teachable. Yeah, I agree. And I guess when you have uh, a multiple first-round picks, you can start to be a little bit more clever with your drafting. You know, if you want a guy of top 12 quality, you, you take the swing for the fences, not necessarily a guaranteed floor kind of pick, but you do that after you've already made pick 11. For example, with someone a little bit more solid. Yeah, like if you're going into the clubhouse with Oliver Moore already on your scorecard, yeah. you can absolutely, you know, maybe to use a, a golf reference for Evan, maybe try to carry the lake on that final hole there. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I have never met one that I didn't try to drive over. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Hey, and when, uh, you know, nine out of ten times you put it in the water, but that one time you put it over, I mean, I'm still missing the eagle putt, but... In this context, you'd assume Steve Eisenman would sink it. Yeah, they, and then you'd never shut up to your friends about the one time that you've hit it, and you conveniently forget the dozen or so that ended up in the drink. Oh, yeah, 1,000%. Same yeah. goes for drafting. Same goes That's for drafting right. the NHL. Yeah, Callum Ritchie's an interesting one. I agree with you, though, Brad. Keep an eye on what those in touch, what McKenzie, what Pronman, uh, what those type are saying, because I, I think it'll give you an indication of what teams are seeing as well. He's a, he's a kind of prospect that could either be fool's gold or where you could derive a lot of value where in retrospect, you know, you looked at the prospect profiles and you're like, why wouldn't you have drafted this guy higher? He had all those tools right there. Why? Just because he took a little longer to put it together. So an interesting one. Well, preseason, he was damn near a consensus top 10 pick. Yeah, yeah. He, he fell a lot. Yeah. So like, obviously, you know, going from pick like nine to pick 25 is only like 15, 16 spots. But in the first round, pick nine to... The 20s is substantial. What I will say is play style. And not that Eisenman only drafts players who play like a ferocious style of game. But for his uh, propensity to want like hard-nosed players who will, you know, use a big frame to drive the net, that might be a reason why the Red Wings wouldn't be as interested in him. It, it, it's not a hard and fast rule. Don't take that as a given. Like not every player fits the mold, that mold. Uh, folks were a little surprised when Lucas Raymond was taken, for example. They shouldn't have been, but, you know, he didn't. It wasn't Simon Edvinson, and I'm not just talking position. Uh, but, yeah, w with Richie, I'm not as sold that this is a, like, yeah, prototypical Steve Eisenman type pick. Yeah, no, I was I was even going to bring that up. Yeah, he's like, even if we like him, I, which for the most part I do, but I don't think Stevie will. <laughs> That's Callum Ritchie. That is our uh, 2023 NHL Draft Prospect Profile Series continued. Uh, more to come on that. Uh, some other news. Cooper Moore, Red Wings prospect, uh, just finished a season with the University of North Dakota, uh, is entering the transfer portal. So their entire defensive roster is turning over, and Cooper Moore is leaving as well. He was drafted out of high school, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So uh, that is a just some minor Red Wings prospect news uh, as the world of uh, college hockey continues to churn. Steve Eiserman returning to the world of international general managing. Kind of surprised after the whole Martin St. Louis fiasco way back. Do you guys remember that story? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I remember. So for those who don't know, uh, Steve Eiserman was the general manager of Team Canada. The last time would have been Sochi 2014. Yep. Martin St. Louis was not selected for that roster. Did he go eventually? Yes, because it, it was an injury replacement. Yeah, and it was it was Chris Kunitz, really. They never said who the last pick was, but it was like Chris Kunitz made that roster because of his chemistry with Sidney Crosby. Martin St. Louis 
took offense to that, and it ultimately culminated in Martin St. Louis requesting a trade. I'm sure there's a lot more that, that led into that, but as Steve Eisman was a general manager of the Tampa Bay Lightning, did not select one of his best players, if not his best player, to be on Team Canada, uh, ultimately kind of soured a relationship. Martin St. Louis requested a trade, ended up going to the Rangers, after 2014, Steve Eisman hung up the skates, what, put away the clipboard. What do you want to call it when a GM retires? Closed the Excel spreadsheet. That's right. Yeah. Gave it, get, handed in his Nokia. Shut down, cap friendly. <laughs> yeah, if you're Pierre Dorian. Uh, and he said no more to uh, the world of international hockey and just focused on the lightning from there on and uh, has been largely outside of the process. Granted, international hockey has been, I don't know, weird sporadic yeah not always there uh but it was announced that he's going to be part of team canada's national men's team uh general managing group uh doug armstrong gm of the st louis blues is going to be general manager steve eisman is going to be associate general manager alongside him as well as shane doan from arizona and senior vp of hockey ops would be scott salmon so eisman stepping back into the fold is this just like a, a temporary measure or do you see him kind of taking a bigger role in this if especially if world cup or or olympics are part of the future for team canada i'm gonna go with his method of being able to legally tamper (laughs) (laughs) i loved all the responses right away like i wonder what doug armstrong and steve eisenman are going to talk about yeah that's right probably drum up 12 more trades just then and there yeah guy likes to win i i don't think there's much more to this other than it's another challenge for him when your country comes calling you yeah. typically answer, especially when you get to decide the fates of some of the best players on the planet. And, and let's be honest, not a lot of uh, Canadian players give a shit about the World Championship. So having you know guys like Armstrong and Eiserman at the helm is beneficial. Yeah, it, it can hopefully maybe lure a couple guys overseas to play that otherwise wouldn't have. And uh, I don't know where the World Championships are this year, but they're usually in some beautiful European city. So it's one hell of a trip. It sounds like a terrible time from all the players. They It sounds like they have a terrible time. They shut down the towns. Always they're going out. There's some uh, some tough games played the next day. Yeah, I was going to say, what's it, tough about it? Playing one of the highest levels of hockey while just absolutely hung over to the ends of the earth. My brain was like, I can't remember if it's Finland or Latvia. It's both. Oh. It's co-hosted by uh, Tampere, Finland, and Riga, Latvia. The sun will just be starting to come out in <laughs> Finland. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, you're going to get skewered by our Finnish listeners now. And I personally welcome it. What I'm, he, a big what head, so I'm a big metalhead, <laughs> so we're, we're still friends. So that's, uh, that's some news on Steve Eiserman. Why don't I uh, bring us into overtime here to close out this episode? Uh, we have a, an interview, hopefully, for next episode. And for this one, let's get into our... Uh, listener questions and comments uh, on overtime, which is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Uh, if you want to support the winged wheel podcast, this is how this is the best way to do it uh, for those who are able. Uh, everything that we do in the show from uh, supporting the Jamie Daniels foundation to working with the Detroit Red Wings for winged wheel podcast day at the LCA. Uh, everything that we do is because of our Patreon supporters. Um, they uh, really are the heart and soul of the show. They get benefits like the uh, Patreon exclusive overtime episodes which record right after these ones uh, they get access to our winged wheel podcast official discord which is a wonderful community as well as being entered into all of our giveaways uh, automatically we give away two tickets to every detroit red wings home game the vast vast majority of them going to our patreon supporters so again patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to support the show we'll take some questions here give wallman the heart says hey guys i got back into hockey last season after not really paying attention to it through college Looks like I missed some dark years, but I'm now back and fully committed to the rebuild. Oh, you missed you missed the worst of it. Good for you for <laughs> your timing there. I even had a dream we got Bedard, so good news there. Your podcast has helped me understand the path for this organization very well, and I look forward to every episode. Keep up the great work. My question is this. It seems like we know that we what we have with Cider. He's well on his way to becoming an elite defenseman if he isn't one already. But what do we need to see next year from Raymond? Go Wings and give Wallman the heart consistency more than anything else um just a full 82 games of near top level raymond his first year he had that rookie dip this year he was playing he had a slow start started playing well got injured you know took a bit to get back to form 
And that's very typical of first and second year guys, so it's not anything to worry about because we've seen what Raymond's top end looks like, and it's obviously very, very good. So we just need to get, you know, as close to 82 games of that as possible. Yeah. You know, he did a lot of work on his shot coming into the NHL, and I almost wonder if he that doesn't need more focus from him. Not that his shot is bad, but the way his opposition plays him is a lot different. I'd like to see, I think he has the tools to be more dangerous with his shot, and if he works on his release a little bit, I feel like he could work with less time and space. You know what I mean? I don't even think it's a skill thing with his shot. He just needs to use it. Because I, I even noticed in a lot of the Red Wings power plays recently when Cider has the puck at the, you know, the top of the point in the middle and Raymond's coming down in kind of that waterfall formation where you give it to a guy who's who's coming downhill towards the net to tee up that shot on his strong side. The number of times he's, they set him up for it uh, last night specifically, I think he only actually let one, maybe two shots go from there. So I don't care how good his shot is or isn't at this point. He's got to use it at some point. I wonder if it's a confidence thing. If, Could be. We if, know all about that. But... <laughs> <laughs> we are the F- Philip Zadina whisperers. We all we know all about the confidence yeah. issues. He, and again, to to reaffirm what Brad said, he's not been bad. I think he's been really good at points and at times way too quiet, definitely. But it, it feels like quiet rather than bad, if that makes sense. Like when a player disappears like that, it's like maybe a confidence thing. Maybe they're fighting something. Could just be that they're a rookie or a sophomore. All of that's pretty acceptable, but he does have to find a way to work through that. Showing up as Lucas Raymond for 82 games makes a difference. Udalali says, can we please mic coaches? Newsy was so incensed that you didn't even need one to know what he was saying, but man, that'd be some great entertainment. It will never happen, but I've always maintained if you did a mic'd up players and coaches version of the game, it would sell like hotcakes. You also don't want to hear what those guys say on the bench and on the ice at all times. If you have a uh, puritanical version of hockey players in your head that will quickly be dispelled, some of the most heinous things that will ever be uttered by athletes are said by hockey players on the ice, only rivaled by hockey players in the dressing room. Uh, but it would be funny as hell. It would be great. Dylan Larkin was mic'd up last night. Now, I so badly. I know they could never do it, but I so badly wanted our friends at uh, Bally Sports to to release that. Even bleep it out if you had to, but that would have been so funny. Anyhow, uh, Hockey Town Racing Academy says, uh, yesterday I learned that th- about the Memorial Cup format, and I think it's stupid that the host city gets an automatic spot in it at the beginning of the season. What do you guys think? I mean, you can't really have a three-team tournament, so you might as well throw in the fourth team. I don't love it, but I, I prefer it to the alternative. Yeah, I don't mind it. I mean, I grew up in Windsor, and Windsor had like multiple appearances and then a host city thing, and... You see enough upsets in junior hockey where it does make for some fun. And it it is kind of cool when a host city that wasn't otherwise one of the top three teams in the country upsets one of them. It might upset the teams of the the fans of the team who lost, but I don't know. It's like a mini tournament. You already won your own league's championship, so it's not like you lost that. I, I think it adds for some spice and drama to the tournament. Well, and also you need to get the city that it's in excited for the tournament. Yeah. Like, because, you know, Kitchener's hosted a couple, one when I was an adult. And, yeah, if Kitchener wasn't in that tournament, I wouldn't have given two shits about it. Uh, you know, Kitchener one was weird because Kitchener did win the OHL championship and then host, so they had to bring in the finalists from the OHL to also play. But, yeah, I, I wouldn't have went to any games. I wouldn't have paid any attention if Kitchener wasn't playing. Yeah, it's a cool way to show off hockey across Canada too. You're uh, you're showing off your best, most like capable hockey junior hockey cities, and fans from the WHL and QMJHL and OHL bleed into each other in terms of what they're paying attention to. I don't mind it. Uh, if it was the only tournament to to crown a champion, like outside of the WHL, OHL, and QMJHL playoffs, then that'd be a different story. But those playoffs do exist, and, and those teams have already won championships. Jefferson Steelflex says, bit of a two-part question, how much higher do you think the potential is for Edvinson over guys like Johansson and Willinder? If it isn't substantially higher, what would be your thoughts on combining Edvinson plus both of our first-round picks, let's say they land 8 and 20, to jump up to third or fourth? Is that enough to move up that far? Would it be worth it? 
if you're moving Edmondson, you're you're to move up in this draft, you're going to the top four. You have to. Anything else isn't worth it. Um, but yeah, Edmondson ceiling to the other two's ceiling, it's substantial. Edmondson can just simply do things on the ice that those guys can't in terms of skating mobility, uh, puck control, et cetera. So, you know, there's a reason he went six, sixth overall and those guys went in the second round. Yeah. I will say you shouldn't discount what Willinder and Johansson could be for this team, especially with how they've performed in their development. But yeah, ultimate ceiling, and this is like, it's more likely than not that highest potential doesn't get realized, but ultimate ceiling is, yeah, substantially higher. Uh, Frank the Tank says, let's say the season ended today and the standings now dictated the order of the draft perfectly. The Wings would own pick 8 and 19. As GM, would you prefer picking two forwards, two defensemen, or split even between a forward and a D-man? Based on how this draft is shaking out and where the Red Wings' needs lie, I would say two forwards. I would tend to agree. Just because I think, obviously, with the Red Wings' first pick, like I pick eight, they'll get a top-tier forward or a top-ish tier forward, and someone who we rate highly will fall to 18 or 19, in and around there. Maybe not like a top-10 pick, but there should be someone there. That said, so much can change between now and then. Uh, I'd be in favor of packaging up a second round pick to move up even further in the first round. So uh, solving the scoring issue sounds nice to me. Yeah. Their follow-up is also for Evan. Who should we look out for next week at the Masters as a dark horse? I was lucky enough to win the lottery for Wednesday's par three practice round, and I want to know who to zone in on. First of all, Go f*** yourself yeah. <laughs> before I answer any questions. Um, you're definitely going to one of the most unique experiences in sports. It's a it's a really cool event. Um, Dark Horses, Sandy Lyle. <laughs> uh, you probably don't even know who that, who that is. Um, I'll let you. But I think his odds are astronomical to win. So, um, yeah, watch out for him. But honestly... There's, I don't know about real dark horses this year. I know Jason Day got an invite this year, like an as an exception. Um, he's actually been playing some really good golf. Maybe he can pull it all together to finally win. Um, I still really like Will Zalatoris. He just has maybe the worst putting stroke in golf out of humans. He has the yips. You need to go look up a gif of his putting stroke. I saw the other Catherine's day. Catherine's like, his putter looks really weird. I was like, wait till you see him take a putting stroke. What's what? The, what is that? What's that all about? I have no idea. He has been a terrible putter his entire life. He's also, he's in his own head right now. Like, I saw him, like, double clutch on a putt. Yeah. Like, he's double clutch exceptionally on a... talented. He's had a, a lot of runner-ups already in his young career. Um, but he's a guy who could put it all together. Um Paul Morikawa is another guy who could put it all together. He hits a cut, which is not great with the course layout at Augusta. Like it's a generally a draw biased course design. Um, but man, when his irons are on, he is easily with the best player in the world. Um, but he's another guy who's got to get his putting totally sorted out. So I w- I don't want to say the field's wide open because I really think Scotty Scheffler and John Rahm are on a different planet than everybody else right now. Um, but there's guys on live like Cam Smith who will be there who's just who's up there as well. But has he lost the competitive edge going to live where it's basically golf golf uh, the Hooters version of golf? <laughs> um, uh, it remains to be seen, but it'll be a very interesting tournament. If he won the British Open right recently, yeah. yeah. He still, he like shot, he shot like a low 60s and that was the one where Rory was, everyone thought Rory was going to win and he just came and took it from him. Is Rory going to make the cut for the Masters? He's been playing exceptionally good too. Um, You never know. Strange things happen when people step onto the grounds at Augusta National. Some guys completely fall off and some guys come out of nowhere. That's really what's special about the tournament. If... Rory finishes second to a guy from the Live Tour. I need every bit of audio within a hundred feet of Rory, Rory McIlroy. I think Rory finished second last year. He chipped in out, of, or he, he, yeah, he rolled it in from the bunker. That's when he went crazy and like threw his club and like 
I think it's in uh, in uh, full swing, actually. Huh. I should watch that. It's really good. Last question here from Mike Raymond, uh, who I believe, believe is a new patron. Welcome, Mike. He says, hey, boys, uh, first time posting. Do you think Eisenman should flip a left-handed D prospect for another team's right-handed D prospect or of equal value? Feels like we could lose one of Willinder, Johansson, Sabrango, Vero, or McIsaac to get a decent right-hand D prospect to shore up the future of the right side. Maybe short on willing trade partners, though. Also, I know plus minus isn't a great stat, but Wallman is plus 17. The next closest wing is Cop at plus three. Insane value. Yep. Um, right-handed D often come at a premium, so I don't think that's very likely. I mean, there are so many left-handed D, and so many of them are good. There aren't spots for all of them. So probably getting to the point where, yeah, you start using them for some sort of trade as a trade filler for something bigger or... Maybe they you flip them for a forward. I don't know, but yeah, it's it's almost getting to the point where it's ridiculous how many left-handed D are in Detroit and Grand Rapids right now. Yeah, and I don't want to call it like impossible. I think it could happen, and I would imagine Eisman would jump at the opportunity. You're talking about different tiers of play. Like Sabrango and Willinder are going to bring two very different returns. Uh, I'm almost more interested in like some kind of depth project like see what right-handed d has been quiet but has tools in another team system that just hasn't worked out yet it, it like you said it might just be a, a lack of partners but it's a good thought for sure all right we're gonna get into our um uh, recording our bonus episodes we're gonna wrap this up uh, we're gonna be back with you on sunday there will be at least two if not three games to cover between now and then depending on if we record before or after the leafs game we'll let you know uh again uh, stay tuned for information and details on Winged Wheel Podcast Day at the LCA. Visit jamiedanielsfoundation.org to also find out how to get tickets for their comedy night event uh, on April 13th and patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast to find out more about how to support the show. We'd like to thank all of our listeners, new and old, as well as our name level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Bertuzzi is straight up missing, Nick Perks, Icon, Lassie, Emil, Lind, Anderson. We are Geelong, the greatest team of all. Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Jordan Bernaski, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Babe Landeskog, Burt Baconator, Carl Brutina Nanoluski, Chimmy, Chris P., Sisson High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, Detroit Rob, DJ Denton, Fanatics Sucks, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hassam al Kassem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Joseph Barry, Kalen Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Massive Wong, Evan Longsaber, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Nicholas Fritz, Oliver, Klozoff, RA, Red 3, Scott Martin, Send It Seawolf, That's What I Appreciates About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, Number One Detroit Red Guys fan, A.A. Ron, Adam Gowitska, Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Ben Barron, Noted Phillips, Zadina Whisperer, and Alex Nedelkovich, Truther, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, C.J. Wilkinson, Connor Leighton, Corey Prida, Darren Fick, Flo T-Cast, Forever and Always Bertuzzi's Lost Tooth, Frank Stanley, who I believe, yeah, who's a newer name level sponsor, George's Biggest Fan, Grand Rapids Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, Instructions Unclear, Cheesebag No Longer Fresh, James Laporte, Jeremiah Adobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S. of the Cheesebag Army, Linda Hull, Matt Keeler, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Norris Sider, O. Ophelia, Reed the Prophet of the Towering Chungus, Stephen, Tatarsas, and the Hodag. Thank you all so very much. We'll talk to you Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.